Glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit, great I am the three in one, glory, 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 while eternal ages run. from each spot and stain. Glory be to him who bought us, made us kings with him to reign. Glory, 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 glory to the Lamb that once was slain. Glory to the King of is king. Glory to the king of nations, heaven and earth, your praises bring. Glory, 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 glory to the king of glory bring. Glory, blessing, praise eternal, thus the choir. Good morning, folks. How's everybody today? Good, wonderful. Today's a wonderful day. We, uh, we got some people back in our midst. Our team from Africa has made it back safe and sound. Amen to that. Praise God for all the work that he was able to do uh, in them and through them over there. I look forward to hearing some testimonies from the people who, uh, who got to experience uh, that experience. So welcome back to them and welcome back to our uh, head pastor, Mr. <laughs> Henry Nappy came back. Him and his wife made it back safely. Uh, looking forward to hearing the word that the Lord has placed on his heart this morning. So we've got a fuller house than we did last week. Um, just before we continue with our uh, praise and worship, I did want to let everybody know of a couple of announcements. I did not grab a bulletin on my way through the door, but I'm sure all of you did. And I just wanted to remind you that uh, Faith in Life is coming up. I actually don't need one, but thank you, wife. I'll take it. Thank you. My wife, everybody. <laughs> uh, just one announcement. You can go ahead and sift through and see what, uh, what pertains to you. But uh, uh, most pressing is that the Faith in Life seminar is coming up on March 9th. And if you have not signed up yet, uh, there is a table in the back of the room where you are able to do so. So please, before you leave here today, if that's something that you had planned to do, uh, go and put your name on that sheet of paper back there. All right, let us uh, go before the Lord, hear what he has to say about praise and worship. That's going to take us to Psalm 66. Verses 1 and 2, I would love if you would stand up and read this along with me. All right. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Father God, we love and praise you. We are here for you this morning. Let everything that we sing the things that we say, the thoughts that enter our mind, uh, the sermon that leaves Henry's lips this morning, let it all be pleasing to you. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Let's lift our voices. Come 
Christian, state what you believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father, as we are in your presence here this morning, we give you thanks. We give you thanks because we know that you love us. We know that you are a faithful God. We know that you are a God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We know that you are a God who wants what's best for each of us. We know that you are a God who has called your church into being. And we thank you, Father. We thank you too, Father, for the provisions of each and every day. Food and water, place to sleep, friends, family, a job. And we know, Father, that every good and perfect gift comes from you and you alone. And, Father, we know that our salvation comes from you. You sent your Son into the world to die for us that we might have life. And not just ordinary life, but life abundant and free. And not just this life, but life everlasting. And yet, Father, we know that we have sinned against you even this morning in thought, word, and deed. Father, we have said things to each other already that should have never been said. Father, sometimes we've even ignored the person sitting next to us and haven't even greeted them. And Father, we have perhaps not even told our wives or husbands that we love them and we're thankful for them, or our moms or our dads or our children. And so, Father, help us to be faithful in encouraging one another and building each other up and helping each other grow and be more and more like you. So, Father, as we sit here and stand here this morning, we confess our sins to you. Father, literally, our sins were nailed to the cross because you became sin for us. Father, we can hardly imagine all of what that means. And so, Father, we say thanks. Thanks for our salvation. Thanks for this life. Thanks for continuing to change us to be more like you. And Father, we know that there are many requests in this room. Some of us have heavy hearts because of what is taking place with our loved ones. Some of us have heavy hearts because of what a doctor has told us. Some of us, Father, have heavy hearts because our children don't know you. 
or our grandchildren or perhaps even our spouse. And so, Father, we pray that you would use us mightily to share the good news of the gospel with those around us. And, Father, that you would call them to yourself. Make them your own. Set them apart. And, Father, we pray for Hebron. We pray, Father, that you would give our leaders wisdom, that you would give them insight, creativity, that you would be honored in the way that they live their lives and the way that they lead us. And so, Father, give them more faith. We pray for the leaders of our country. We ask, Father, that you would draw them to you, that they would all see you as Lord and King of Kings. And Father, we pray for the world. And we know, Father, that you know everything that is taking place. Help us to trust in you. And to live out your will. Father, we thank you for the table in front of us. Thank you that you are, we're reminded again today of what you have done for us. Your body broken and your blood poured out for us. Bless this hour in more ways than we can imagine or think. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing of our assurance.
always, when we come before the word of the Lord, I ask you to pay close attention to what, give, what uh, the word speaks to us today. Jesus is going to ask us a question at the end of this text. So I want you to listen well enough that you can answer it. Mark chapter 8, the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf of bread with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive and understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? And this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, after hearing the passage, and I prepped you for it, after hearing the passage, let me ask you a question. Do you not yet understand? Was that text clear enough for you? A couple of weeks ago, I went ahead and uh, was looking at this passage and read it in preparation for thinking through the sermon and stuff like that, thinking through what I would want to say, and I got to the end of that line and read, do you not yet understand? And I said to myself, nope, not yet. But I got a couple weeks yet, so <laughs> got a couple weeks still to go. Before we look at this passage, I do want to point something out. Um, uh, Brendan highlighted it earlier, but I think that it's well worth noting uh, to give thanks to the Lord for the safe return of our Rwanda team. That was great, quite a blessing. An even greater blessing is, as far as I can tell so far, uh, the ministry went wonderfully there, and people were very much so touched by what took place. Uh, as you prayed, and I trust that you did, for the Rwanda team, so it is well worth our, our being able to follow up with the team and ask and check and make sure to see what it is the Lord has done. So I want the, Romania, the, the Rwanda team to stand up, if you would, very briefly, so everybody knows who you are. There's the folks, everybody got eyes on them. There's the folks that we need you to talk with the following the service. Thanks very much, you can have a seat. So, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? Well, on one level, it's fairly clear what's going on, and I hope that you kind of followed it as, as I read the passage. Jesus is in a bit of a conflict once again with the Pharisees. The Pharisees come, and they ask him a question, and what we'll see here in a little bit is that they're clearly trying to trip him up, and they ask Jesus a question, and he gets frustrated with them and, and basically turns away, doesn't respond to them. They get in the boat with the disciples. The disciples are fussing because they don't have any bread. Jesus talks about the leaven of the Pharisees, uh, the yeast of the Pharisees, the teaching of the Pharisees, and kind of says, you know, beware of this. The disciples get all kind of flustered. Jesus notices that they're flustered and says, come on, don't you get this yet? How many baskets of loaves of extra pieces of bread did you pick up after we fed the 5,000? And they say, 12. We know that answer. And then they said, well, what about that when we fed the 4,000? They said, seven baskets. And then he says, do you still not understand? And I think there's this long pause and confused looks on everybody's faces. This highlights a theological point, and we're going to take a, a second to make a couple of theological uh, points here for us before we look at this passage. This is, highlights something that we call the doctrine of illumination. The doctrine of illumination now, the doctrine of inspiration teaches us, reminds us that from the scriptures we learn that this is God's word, that working through the human authors, the Holy Spirit has actually written for us God's word before us. This is why we understand and why we submit to it, why we recognize that it is our authority and guiding shape in all that we do in life. That's a doctrine of inspiration, the fact that the Holy Spirit has provided for us God's word here, his actual word for us so that we might live our lives faithfully and godly before him. 
But having had the word given to us, this is God's word, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will understand it or know what to do with it. And this is the doctrine of illumination. What the doctrine of illumination tells us from the scriptures is that even given God's word before us, we can understand the words, we understand the English, we understand what a noun is and what a verb is, we can follow what's going on and still miss the point of the text. And that's why we lean heavily into the doctrine of illumination. That is the promise that God makes that he will work through the scriptures so that we can understand. I'm sure that many of you had the experience where you've learned all it is that you need to learn about something and you understand and you know how it works and yet things simply don't click. I'm sort of a sports fanish kind of a guy, so one day I thought, you know what, I gotta figure out this rugby thing. I don't know this rugby thing. And I had a friend of mine that played rugby, and so I went and, and kind of studied and learned and read everything about rugby, and then saw one match or game, or whatever they call it, uh, saw one, one match of the game, um, and still came away n- realizing that I did nothing, I knew all the rules, I knew what was happening, but nothing clicked. Have you ever had that experience where you know that, you, that you're clear on what the teacher is saying, you're clear on what you're supposed to be learning, and yet it just doesn't click. That kind of an insight, that kind of clicking, is what the doctrine of illumination leads us to in seeking out God's Word. We have God's Word. It is God's Word if we understand it or if we don't. But because of our sinfulness, because of our brokenness, even having God's Word before us still doesn't mean that we'll understand it. The disciples, having Jesus before them, Having him physically in their presence, teaching them, guiding them, leading them, still they didn't understand. And this is what we need to do when we lean into the doctrine of illumination. I didn't do something today, and I hope that you caught it. Usually, after reading the word, and before I have you sit down, I offer a prayer. That prayer is not just a formal, pro forma kind of thing that I'm trying to do. The prayer is for illumination from the Holy Spirit because I realize that even though we have God's word and even though God's word has been read to us, the brokenness, our finiteness, our limitedness as human beings still needs to be overcome by the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he can speak powerfully into our lives so that we just don't hear the words, but we understand the significance of behind the words. And so, seeking the Holy Spirit's blessing, let's go before the Lord. Father, we do pray at this time that you would bless us with that illumination, that as you have provided the word for us, so now you would provide that supernatural gifting of your spirit so that we can understand the significance of these words. That what I say in trying to speak about this passage would be used by your spirit, not necessarily communicate what I'm saying, but to communicate what you are saying. Lord, every time we come to the scriptures, we need to pray and seek for that illumination, and we do it this time through Christ our Lord, we ask. Amen. So with the divine illumination of the Holy Spirit, trusting in the divine illumination of the Spirit, let's take a look at this passage and see what it is that Jesus wants us to understand. Begins with the conflict with the Pharisees. In verse 11, the Pharisees come to Jesus and begin to argue with him, seeking for, from him a sign from heaven in order to test him. Now, do we understand what's going on here? Um, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus, and this is one of the typical conflicts that Jesus has with the Pharisees. But one of the things that, we, that Mark makes real clear to us, and you can pick this up if you just read the English text the numerous times, is how conflictual the Pharisees are. Um, You might have friends like this. I certainly have friends like this, that every time I get into any conversation with them that has to do with the faith, they always come with an incredibly belligerent attitude that they ask. I, I have this one friend that starts almost every conversation with, you don't really believe blah, 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 do you? 
I mean, it is just, they're, they're, they start with, a, with an, an attitude that is just, not, they're not seeking any information from me. They're not seeking a, a dialogue. They, they're not even seeking to challenge me on anything. What they want to do is just make me feel bad or make me feel dumb or something like that. It's a conflictual kind of a response to this. You can see this with the Pharisees. The Pharisees come, they begin to argue with him. So they come immediately with a with a. Uh, uh, an attitude willing to start a fight a little bit in order to have a discussion. And man, if you don't have people in your life that that is part of your response, you need to get out there and start talking with some people more. If you share the gospel, you don't have to share the gospel. You need to simply identify yourself as a believer. And you will have people, this is the nature of the world, the nature of the brokenness of the world in which we live in uh, from the time of Adam, there is a seed of the woman. There is a seed of a serpent. There are those who conflict with the gospel. And if you come forward and identify yourself clearly as a Christian, there will be folks that, that, there will be folks that are intrigued and that are interested and that God is working in their lives and that is beautiful. And then there are those who just want to come and argue. Seeking from him, uh, the seeking here, uh, the word is kind of driving at, the, driving at him. They're, they're kind of, they're pushing, uh, seeking from him a sign from heaven in order to test him. Uh, when I was a student, uh, teachers, all, all their tests were trying to make me fail. Uh, that was what teachers were trying to do, and it really bugged me. Um, and then when I started teaching, I made sure that all of my tests were intended to illuminate and to help and to guide and to educate the teachers, the, the students. That's my testing. I made sure that I did it right. Here, the testing is absolutely intended to put an obstacle in front of them. That's what Jesus is, is, is runs into. He has this interaction with the Pharisees, and they are questioning, they're arguing with him, trying to put an obstacle in front of him so that he will stip, stumble over it. What's the obstacle? Give us a sign from heaven. All right, now, we didn't read this passage. It's immediately before this. It forms a context of our discussion where Jesus feeds the 4,000. A couple chapters earlier, he had fed the 5,000. And they're very similar stories, similar work, making the similar point that we get to in a little bit. Jesus here has done miraculous things. It might, be, it might strike our English minds that what they're asking for is a miracle, Jesus, do some miracle for us so that we can see and believe that you're who you say you are. That's not what they're doing. Mark is real clear whenever he talks about miracles, he uses the terms mighty works. A mighty work or a wondrous work is, is his phrasing for a miracle. What the, what the Pharisees are asking for is not a miracle, but proof that Jesus it comes from heaven. They've all, Jesus has already done miracles in front of them. The Pharisees have already seen those miracles. And as a matter of fact, in chapter 3, the Pharisees have already said, well, this is from the devil. And so when they're asking him, they're saying, prove to us that you're not from the devil, that you're actually from God. That's the sign in which they are asking for. That's what they're looking at. Now, Jesus responds in verse 12. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit sighed deeply in his spirit. Um, uh, for the non-parents in the room, I have to explain what that is because all the parents know what it is. Okay, this is, you know, you're, you're not angry. You're sort of annoyed. You're dismayed. You're disappointed. You're frustrated. Jesus just is frustrated. He's disappointed that they are asking here for a sign. And he refuses to give one. Now, why is that? One of the great lines in Scripture is when the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders look at Jesus hanging on the cross and they say, just come on down and we'll believe who you are. And Jesus refuses to come on down from the cross. And because he doesn't come down from the cross, all of us get to experience his salvation. Because he didn't come down from the cross, and what the Pharisees here are saying is, we demand that you meet our expectations. Show us the way we want to be shown who you are. Prove, according to our standards, what you want to do. 
Now, every time the Pharisees say anything in the Scriptures, we all know that they're the bad guys, and so we all immediately write off everything that the Pharisees do. Pharisees are saying something, we know that it's bad. Okay, Pharisees are coming in a conflictual manner to Jesus, and we have so many people in our lives that come in a conflictual manner with Jesus. We know what all of that looks like. Okay, we understand that. But realize that the Pharisees here are doing something that maybe you do as well. Maybe you do it a lot. I know that I do it a lot. Jesus, meet my expectations. These are my expectations, and I demand that you meet them if I am going to be happy. Lord, just keep my family safe, and I'll be happy. Lord, just crack the sky and let me see a little bit and I'll be happy. Lord, get me past this test and I'll be happy. Lord, now in God's bountiful goodness, he so often satisfies the expectations that we have. But the beauty of the scripture is that it reminds us that the expectations, the fulfillment of God's blessings in your life far surpass any expectation that you have, far surpass it. Jesus here refuses to meet the expectations of the Pharisees because they're built on unbelief, not on need, not on a desire to know him, not on a desire to have their faith strengthened, but built on unbelief. And frankly, look at verse 13. It's kind of scary. And Jesus left them got on the boat and went to the other side of the lake. This is the last time the Pharisees show up in the sea around Galilee. They enter into the picture again when Jesus goes to Judea and into Jerusalem. But here now, finally, Jesus has left them in their unbelief. Now they're in the boat with the disciples and the disciples are fixated on the fact that they don't have any bread. And Jesus says, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now m- many of you might know what leaven is, uh, yeast. Uh, it's, uh, you take a little bit of the bread that has already got the leaven in it. You mix it in with your new dough and that then yeast, the, the, the leaven spreads throughout the whole, whole loaf, enables the whole loaf to be fermented and, ra- and rise. How bread is made, because uh, I just buy it out of a store. Uh, okay, so, but the yeast here is, uh, the, or the leaven is somehow that, that which spreads throughout the whole loaf. And that's the key thing about leaven. And it's the key spiritual image that the Old Testament and the, fair, and the Jewish tradition uses about leaven is that it's such a wonderful picture of the corruption of our souls. What does sin do in our lives? It, it is leaven. It works itself through every, it works itself through the whole loaf, just a little bit. And ultimately, the whole loaf is penetrated by that sinfulness. And it is absolutely true if you have ever, and I know that you have, been convicted by the Lord of a sin area in your life, and you have tried to keep it constrained and tried to keep it contained so that it doesn't go anywhere. And you know that that's not what sin does. The corruption of our souls, that corruption of sin, stretches into every area of our lives. And Jesus, hot after this interaction with the Pharisees, has the disciples in a boat together, and he takes a teaching moment. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, we can understand why he has this conversation. He's just had this interaction with the Pharisees. But what exactly does he mean by the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? You can kind of see why the disciples are a little confused here. They're having their own conversation about, hey, uh, you know, we just picked up seven basket full of bread, and now we only brought one with us. What's the matter with us? Kind of a thing. And Jesus is overhearing this conversation. He's talking to them about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. Now, what would that leaven be? What is that corruption? 
of the Pharisees, the corruption of Herod. The corruption of the Pharisees is pretty straightforward to us. Most of us know what that is. That's a hypocrisy, the self-justification, the righteousness, the arrogance, the pride of their standing and of their position, the, the, the sense that they are going to save themselves, that, they're to, that their status before God is enough to put them over the top and allow them into God's position. We know those kind of understandings that expectation of the leaven of the Pharisees. But what about the leaven of Herod? And here's the thing. I don't think that what Jesus is saying is beware this type of leaven and then also beware this kind of leaven. He, he says beware the leaven of the Pharisees, beware the leaven of, the, of Herod, but he doesn't really have two different ideas in mind. He has one idea. What is Her- Herod, remember, was the political ruler of the time. Herod has one real main interest in mind, and that is advancing his own career and being his the self-made man and ruling things politically, being recognized by Rome, being honored by Rome, et cetera, et cetera. What what is the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? What do they have together? They 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 deal with two totally separate areas of life, but there is one commonality between them: their rejection of of Jesus. It is their rejection of Jesus that holds together the leaven of the Pharisees and the corruption of Herod. It is their rejection of Jesus, of himself, that Jesus is warning the disciples about. He is saying, don't let that little bit of sin begin to creep into your life that eventually will flower into a rejection of Christ himself. The disciples then start talking with each other and they say, I think this is because we didn't bring enough bread along. And Jesus in verse 17 says, well, you know, why are you discussing the fact that Jesus hits them with a, with a bunch of questions and, and the questions have a, 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 a censure tone to them. They're, they're trying to say, come on, you guys. But there's also a pleading tone in Jesus' voice. Come on, you guys. He's, he's both saying, come on. He's both censuring them and pleading with them. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Well, because we don't have any bread. Do you not yet perceive or understand? I guess maybe not. Are your hearts hardened? Gosh, I really hope not. Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Evidently. <laughs> do you not remember? Uh, I think. How many loaves when we fed 5,000? 12. Got that one. How many loaves when we fed the 4,000? Seven. I got that one. Do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? Jesus, what's the thing that ties together these miracles? What's this thing that ties together his his warnings about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? It is simply this. Jesus is not disappointed with the dullness of the disciples. He's used to that. He's disappointed in what the disciples are dull about. They still don't get him. They don't put him and see him at the center of everything that he is doing. They don't see him as the most fundamental central point of everything in which is happening here. What's the point of the 12 baskets of, of bread? That Jesus is the superabundant one. What is the point of the seven basketfuls? That Jesus is the superabundant one. What's the warning about the leaven of the Pharisees and leaven of... I was at a worship service a little bit ago, and we had a very wonderful 20 minutes. When it came time for the sermon, it was a very wonderful lecture, um, and Jesus was never mentioned except in a real pro forma way at one point. Jesus was never mentioned. It was an inspiring lecture. It was a very positive lecture. It would have functioned well in any classroom. But at worship, if at no place else, 
May we have one focus. May we be focused upon Jesus Christ and him alone. And of course, what Jesus is saying is not just at worship, but when you're in the boat together, when you're worried about your food, when you're answering questions, when you're remembering things, don't get the facts right and miss the signification, the significance. Miss the meaning. That's what the disciples have done here. And this passage would make me cry because when I first read it, I got to the end and went, well, I don't get it. I mean, I know what's happening, but I I know there's more here. This passage would make me cry if it doesn't make me cry for hope and grace and mercy with that little word, yet. Do you not yet understand? No, Lord, so much of my life, I have to confess, I do not yet understand. But the yet implies God's continual work in the disciples' lives and his continual work in my life and in your life so that more and more through the blessing of the doctrine of illumination, the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, we can yet understand more and more of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the blessing that you give to us through Jesus Christ. That as our Lord and our Savior, we can come to him in all kinds of trials and tribulations for he is the center of our lives. Lord, we do indeed need to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herod. We need to beware of losing sight of that center core of who you are and the fact that you dominate every aspect of our lives. Lord, we know that to be true. We pray that you would make that more and more true in our lives each and every day. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.
this time, sorry, at this time, we are going to enter into a time of uh, the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's bow our heads again and prepare our hearts to give. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are here for you. We are here, Lord, so that we can strengthen our relationship with you, so that we can deepen our understanding of you, so that we can humble ourselves and come to realize that there's so much of you that we don't know and that we don't understand, that the finiteness and the limitedness of, of our, our human understanding, Lord, could never fathom the vastness that you are. Uh, but Lord God, the access that you have given us and the relationship that you have promised us and the redemption that you offer us so freely are things that we can grasp and understand, Lord, and we accept them and we thank you that you would give them so freely, along with all of the other things that you provide for us in our lives. And at this time, Lord, we take just a portion of that and return it back to you uh, so that you can do with it what you will for the praise of your glory. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and uh, continue to lift our voices to him. Out of the 
During the prayer time today, Jerry confessed that many of us perhaps did not welcome faithfully the people we are standing near. And so, I want you to turn before the benediction to the people around you and say, Jesus Christ is your living hope. Jesus Christ is your living hope. I love what you do with that thing. It's unbelievable. And now a quick encouragement for you. Immediately following the benediction, I strongly encourage you to take a part of the Sunday school program that we have here for all ages. We've got two wonderful adult classes going. If you've never heard Jerry in a classroom setting, he is marvelous up in the uh, main fellowship hall. And right across the hallway here, Katrina doing a fabulous job walking through the spiritual disciplines. Please join one of those two adult classes. Kids, lots of things available for ministry as well. Because this is a way in which we learn to focus our attention upon Jesus Christ our living hope. And as we go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give to you peace now and forevermore. Amen.